Ladies and gentlemen, many of you would argue that Garry Kasparov is the greatest chess player who ever lived. And in this video, I am going to show you five examples of how he absolutely demolished players who were world champions. Now, before we jump into the games, a little bit of a technicality. Garry played against players in the Soviet Union who were former world champions, but he played them 15 to 20 years sometimes after they were at the peak of their powers. I did not include those games because I felt a little bit strange adding games of a young Kasparov beating up on slightly older players that were past their prime. However, the majority of the games we are looking at are of players who, after they played against Kasparov, did go on to become world champions, except for one player, but you will see who I'm talking about. Let's get into it. The first game that I would like to show you is Moscow 1985. This is in the middle of a massive rivalry that lasted about a decade with Anatoly Karpov. Uh, well, about a decade is actually a bit of an overstatement. Uh, more, like, more like five years, but it felt like a decade. Um, and Garry Kasparov has the black pieces. This is their world championship match. And we're just going to get right into it. Uh, we have a Sicilian defense, something that Garry employed heavily. Uh, and E6. So... What Gary goes for here um, is a Taimanov Sicilian with knight c6, but obviously, listen, Gary, Gary also played d6. He went into Nidorf Sicilians frequently. He dabbled in the other Sicilians as well. But in this case, we have an open Sicilian with knight to c6, and we have knight to b5. Knight to b5 used to be a, a pretty critical line because essentially what white wants is to jump into d6. That's what white wants. White's like, well, you've given me this. I might as well go and take it. Um, and so what black would do is play the pawn to d6, uh, and then, and then, you know, this kind of a little bit, a little bit of a waste of, waste of time, you know, waste of time, you're moving a lot of pawns, uh, and now c4. And what white's idea here is that you're going to have really big difficulties ever getting this move off the ground now that I've played c4, and one of my knights will stand behind the pawn. This knight will most likely rotate back around this way, having done its job. So knight f6, knight 1c3, Gary's like, all right, let me kick your knight out to a3, and um, now, norm, you know, normal people here would play something like bishop 2e7 in castle, but Garry Kasparov is anything but normal, and that's why he was world champion for as long as he was. He plays the move d5, the move that he can't play. He can't play this move. That was the whole point of Karpov's setup, right? So what Garry does here is he just gives away the pawn completely with takes, 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 and puts his knight on b4. So he's wasting time in the opening, it seems like, and he's down a pawn. But Gary understands, you know, from his preparation, obviously, let's keep in mind, this is 1985, there are no engines saying, bad, 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 you can't play that in the opening. The, it's kind of difficult to protect this pawn. You know, it's a loner pawn. But what's interesting is that even though white can play bishop 2e2, black, on the other hand, doesn't take the pawn. What? I thought the whole point was to, no. No. Gary's like, go ahead, you have it. You take it. I don't need it. What I'm gonna do is utilize the empty space around the pawn for my pieces. So right now, Gary has one and a half moves, I would say, up on Karpov. Um, what does that mean? That means that he has four pieces out and about. He's about to have potentially all his pieces out and about. Karpov needs a couple more moves. He needs to at least move this bishop and this knight needs a turn or two to get back into the game. I say two because b5 is coming. And keep this move b5 in mind because it's the one move that's the difference maker between the two positions. Because if black can play that move, uh, white is never going to get this knight into the game. All right, let's not also forget that, you know, if white's not careful, there's going to be all sorts of attacks on the f2 square. So Karpov plays bishop to g5, obviously. Uh, Gary plays rook to e8. And now, now we, really, we really have, like, the, the, the moment of the game. How does white proceed? If white plays the move knight to c4, oops. I attack both of these things, and yet, this is the best move in the position. Apparently, here, white has to just give up this rook. And the argument is that you take with the king, and suddenly the material shift is to black by one point. We go from black being down a point to up a point, but now black loses a lot of the firepower. This knight, as powerful as it was teaming up with the bishop, the bishop's gone. The knight has no home now. Literally. A3 traps the knight. So black now needs to start trading things off in order to try to get the knight back. So for example, something like A5 to try to rescue this knight. But actually it is white who has dominant peace presence in the center. How quickly everything changes, right? So Karpov needed to play the move knight to C4, but it's not his style. That's not his style. 
and I don't know if Kasparov saw this prior. I haven't spoken to Kasparov. I don't know if there's some interview somewhere about the game, but knight c4, knight e3 is a fascinating idea, and probably the best thing to do, actually, is for black to play knight d3, plant the knight on d3. More on that later, because in the game we had this, keep this move in mind, b5, to negate the power of the knight on a3, and now this. And this game in the history books of chess is known as the Kasparov Octopus Knight. Why is it known as the Kasparov Octopus Knight? Because that knight fights for eight squares. Uh, so you should know that a knight on the opponent's side of the board uh, controls eight squares around it, right? That's why it's known as an Octopus Knight. Just watch the rest of this game develop and look at that knight. It's not going to be too difficult because the knight doesn't move. Karpa plays knight back to b1, trying to bring the knight back into action. Gary kicks out this bishop and now attacks this knight, and the knight also has to go to the side of the board, and a very calm bishop d6. Look at these pieces, and look at this one. None of Karpov's pieces can move, which is normally what Karpov does to other people. So Gary uses his playing style, which is dynamics, right? That fantastic preparation, dynamics, to play like Karpov, who is restricting, putting all your pieces in the back rank and not letting you move them, suffocating you to death. Gary, in this game, proceeds to just confidently combine his playing style with almost the style of his opponents. Look at what he's doing. In the middle of this game, Gary's like, all your pieces suck, so I can use dynamics, pushing pawns in front of my own king to create an attack on you. Let's reroute our knight, because it doesn't really have much forward movement. Let's put our queen on f6 to potentially support this and win control of this entire diagonal. As Karpov tries to, you know, reverse Fianchetto his bishop, maybe he's gonna try to play for f4, it, it's not really clear actually what Karpov is going to do, so he tries to play on the queen side, uh, that very quickly dies out, <laughs> there's nothing there, so he decides to play queen a2, he's like, well, I, I mean, I gotta do something, right, so let me put my queen on a2, uh, bishop g6, and this move, so this is sort of fighting for the queen side, the queen, the bishop, everything trying to open up, and yet, um, there's nothing, so Gary just plays g4, Queen d2, don't lose your h6 pawn, don't let the queen come in, f3, okay, now it's time to pick up the pawn, so now material balance has been restored, uh, but here's the problem, queen d4 check, king to h1, and knight f6, and again, you have played this entire game without two horses, and I've played with one horse that's worth two horses myself, which is an imbalance of about three horses, that knight on d3 still hasn't moved, and there's nothing that can be done about it, white is completely paralyzed, this game, right here, Zero uh, is material balance is actually plus one to white, and yet it's minus seven. It's minus seven. And Gary converts this by dropping the second knight in, and finally the knight is captured, but Karpov just decides to sacrifice the queen and try to win the bishop, but it's just, you, ju you just don't have enough. The problem is that even after this, I have this beautiful move. If you take my queen, you lose one rook on the back rank, and then the second rook on the back rank, and after knight b2, in this position, takes, takes, Rook to e1, Karpov resigned, because whatever he blocks with, he is going to be checkmated. And this was one of the most violent games that Garry Kasparov ever detonated in his many hundreds of games, not many hundreds, but at least a hundred games, uh, against Karpov, the Octopus Knight game, when the Knight landed on d3 uh, in that middle game on move 16, it was only removed about uh, 20 moves later. I mean, approximately 20 moves later, and it was already dead lost by then. So that's how he beat Karpov in 1985. Let's keep on moving. So as I explained in the introduction, there's a little bit of technicality when associated with naming people world champions, for example. Like, when these games were happening, not all these people were world champions because Gary was the world champion. Well, Nigel Short, one of the greatest players ever as well, of his, particularly of the 90s, he wasn't ever the world champion. In 1993, he played for the world championship, so we're just going to say he's a world championship caliber player, obviously. And this is a game from 1994 in Amsterdam. Uh, we have e4, and uh, Nigel Short likes a lot of these e6 positions, sometimes with b6. In this case, uh, the French defense. This is knight c3, the classical variation after knight f6, Steinitz. You can also play the Wienauer here with bishop b4, which is a headache variation. And this is known as just pure classical French. e5, f4. And black fights back with c5, a6, b5 on the queen side. White tries to checkmate black over here. This battle has raged on for many, many years. Uh, and there's many breaks of the position here for black. Like black can take on d4, black cannot take on d4, black can play a6, b5, black can play b6, bishop, b7, b6, a5, bishop, a6. There's a lot of different ways to play this. But in this case, 
we have the bishop coming to c5 and we have castles and we have long castles and there's going to be there's going to be a war so essentially we're going to get h4 h5 uh and or h4 something with some sort of attack and black is going to try to counter attack over here now at its very essence i just want to draw your attention to something the french defense is uh is something like this this kind of end game with knight versus knight well knight and bishop versus knight and bishop but this light squared bishop being a problem for black and black usually needs to defend these sorts of positions um now in this game we were a little far from that but that trade will happen very quickly now we have h4 obviously idea being to infiltrate over here uh and we have knight takes d4 bishop takes d4 b5 you can also play like i said this this queen b6 you're actually going to see something oh sorry the move never happened uh queen b6 and something like this and white can take and go for this end game white can do this uh, there's also positions where white just keeps attacking and lets black take them. The thing is, if, if, if white backs up, black gets a little bit of momentum, but white can also do this. White can just keep the queen on the board and, you know, try to create an attack, but you lose a little bit of momentum. Anyway, b5, Gary Kasparov plays rook to h3. Rook lift. This is the point. And the point is that at any moment I can join the fight on the queen side. It's a nice move, nice flexible move. Okay, b4 attacks the knight, the knight jumps to a4, hits the bishop. He's like, take me please, yes. And now we have a break here. Uh, theory has shown over time that a5 is pretty good for black. You just defend your pawn. You're not really afraid of this attack. And uh, if you can trade your light scored bishop actually on a6, you kind of like that because that piece sucks for black. And that piece can join the attack for white. So a5, bishop a5, bishop a6 is, uh, is pretty decent. But uh, Nigel Short plays f6, which, again, doesn't look completely unreasonable. Giving up this pawn, but fighting for the middle. Anyway, Kasparov takes on b4, this. And, uh, well, now begins the, the game uh, quality, which will feature him in this video. Queen to d6. Attacks e6. Queen to f6. Defends e6. And now Kasparov plays f5 huh well okay obviously if pawn takes we take this pawn and then we win the rook because it's check okay that's at least self-explanatory and if queen f5 we play rook to f3 that's not made that is defended but let's say the queen comes to e4 or something this falls that's really the major problem and uh, then the other pawns fall so f5 is a really really good move plays on the coordination of black's position Black plays queen to h6 check. Gary moves out of the way. And uh, this seems to guard everything. Everything is protected. But that's the beautiful nature about being uh, a legendary player. Not every move you play needs to be violent. Sometimes the slowest of moves is the killer. Like last game. Not winning the pawn bag, just slowly playing around it. Rook f3. In fact, trading a rook. Trading a piece that's an attacking piece. Yeah, just trading it. Just giving it up. I mean, like, you have no more pieces on this side of the board that can create an attack, but because your queen is so powerful here, Gary understands that these three pieces are dominated by one. That's all he needs. And then he'll, he'll take his time, and then he'll win. So we have queen f6 back, re-hitting both pawns. You're not really hitting h4 because you could have just taken it, but e6 would fall. Now Gary plays bishop h3. He's like, how are you going to defend this? Oh, with your king. Well, that's interesting. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. I can't really make progress with my knight. I mean, if I play knight c5, we just trade. That doesn't benefit me at all. My rook can't really sacrifice itself. I can't really move any pawns. That's what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. One, you know, something has to give. You have to take. I mean, if you don't take, it can be a problem. Um, you can play d4. I mean, not that you have to take. Uh, but uh, you have to move the pawn. If you play d4, it kind of makes sense. Uh, then Gary would have switched the play to the g file. Uh, and slowly, black just runs out of moves. So, and not to mention, you can just walk through with the pawn. But dc? Now the quiet move, knight c3. It was all about winning back the e4 square. Now Gary's down two pawns. Six to four. Is it felt? Nah. I mean, black hasn't moved two pieces. It's been 23 moves, 24 moves. He hasn't moved two of these pieces. Queen e7, no queen trade. No queen trade if you want to launch a successful attack. Yeah, this is coming, this is coming. And this h4 pawn, by the way, still allowing knight g5. Um, and the game ends in pretty brutal fashion. Knight g5 check, king g8, 
And again, a quiet move. The only move, by the way, the only move, because after this, you just take the pawn. Finally, you cash in. Rook has to come up. And now Rook d6. And once you lose this pawn, all four pieces of whites join the attack. Bishop e6. The one bishop move that black finally got to make after 31 moves. The bishop is dead. Rook e8 is coming. And in this position, Nigel Short resigned because Rook e8 just leads to absolute devastation. So that's how Gary Kasparov uh, negated the French bishop for 31 moves in Amsterdam of 1994. Let's go to the next game. If you know anything about Vladimir Kramnik, you know that in the year 2000, he upended Gary Kasparov uh, for, the, uh, for the World Championship match. I mean, Kramnik was the successor. Uh, that's the right word, right? I'm not really good at English. I'm good at making chess videos. And this is a game in uh, Novgorod. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, in 1994, as Kramnik was on the come up, and Kasparov was really at the peak of his powers, I would say, like 80s, 90s, just unstoppable. And we have a slight sideline transposition here, uh, but we get back very quickly to the open Sicilian. This is the Sveshnik of Sicilian. We've seen many Sicilians in many Gary Kasparov videos, um, but Bishop G5, A6, the knight comes back to uh, A3. Actually, you'll recognize the structure from the Karpov game, but there there was a pawn on C4, uh, which promptly got traded off for the pawn on D5. So a little bit of overlap in the positional elements. The theory isn't the most important thing. I will say that right here, white has two choices, c3 and c4. Very common break on move 11 of the Sveshnik of Sicilian. And for some reason, my nose is just really allergic to this game. It's been very itchy only for this game. c3. c4 also possible, but c3 tries to bring the knight back around this way. And rook b8. This is a move. Uh, there's, there's other moves here. Black can try to immediately attack on the queen side. Black can also move the bishop out of range of the knight and just park it on this diagonal. Um, and, uh, in this position, Gary Kasparov plays the move h4. He was a man of culture, ahead of the times of Alpha Zero and all these computers that move their h-pawns up the board. Here's the idea. If you take the pawn on h4, you resign on the next move, because queen to h5, which is the benefit of, uh, having the h-file with the rook on it, versus a king that's already castled. You haven't yet castled, so the pawn is untouchable. And the other idea is that the bishop actually can't move. So you're going to use this h-pawn, as we just saw in the French game, potentially to just leave it there for the future, or to storm it forward and team it up, or you're playing against the piece. It's not even clear if it's positional or attacking. Okay, well, sorry, that, that was a misclick. Karp of, uh, Kramnik did not lose his bishop on the next move. Knight to e7. Here's what Kramnik wants. He actually wants this bishop to get traded, rendering this h-pawn completely useless, uh, because the, you're not actually playing against anything, and he'll just play king h8, and then maybe he'll use the g-file for himself, he'll play f5, knight g6, and he has a perfectly viable position. Queen to d2, immediately looking to get into h6. He's like, come and get some. You want to come to h6? By all means. I'm going to take on e4, you're going to have no advantage. All right, let's defend the pawn. Now, you know, while white has taken their eye a little bit off the center, it's time for black to strike with the move d5. Uh, if you take on d5, uh, black's idea is to activate the queen, at which point you no longer have the move short castle because you tragically blundered checkmate in one, uh, and then I feature you in future viewer noob games. Uh, but, you know, uh, Kasparov, slightly stronger than the average Gotham subscriber, chooses to castle queenside. Yes, he still blunders a pawn, sort of. Not really, because after rook h3 and queen h6 and rook g3, black resigns. Black just gets completely slaughtered. There is not even a check here. So you just took on a2 for nothing. You don't check me at all. Queen can't go and attack a castle on its own. So, instead of that, Kramnik plays the move e4 and attacks the bishop. The bishop moves out of the way, and now you have a choice. Do you try to nerf Kasparov's queen, which will probably be your downfall, or do you take on a2? He takes on a2. The difference being, the difference being, there is no bishop to attack the king. It's a major difference. If, if, if Kasparov doesn't have the bishop, he's not really as powerful. But still, he's Kasparov, so he plays queen to h6. I mean, this is just a scary move. The queen takes a first-class ticket across the country and stands right by your king like, shouldn't have said what you said, because now I'm going to beat your ass. Don't, uh, don't play games with me. All right, so I don't actually think that's what Kramnik or any of his pieces were saying. So Kramnik brings the queen back and says, I'm up a pawn and I'm going to be the world champion in six years. I don't know how I know that. 
Knight to d4 attacks the queen, not a problem, the queen goes to b6. And in the future, we are either going to attack with b4 or, keep in mind the queens are on the same line, as long as I can defend my queen, I could play f5, maybe, and trade queens, right? Okay. Rook h3. We clearly, we see Kasparov having a, you know, a, a liking for this move. Uh, and his idea, obviously, rook g3, well, rook f3 would be nice. Rook g3. King h8. Bishop g4, just slowly bringing the forces. And now is where the game begins, really. Knight to e6. Okay. The idea of knight to e6 is actually very simple. If you take me, your queen now no longer defends anything. And after this, this, and just actually simply rook d7, you resign. You cannot defend everything. You play a move like rook to e8, that looks nice. I play rook g3. Kasparov calculated all of this. These two pieces are once again out of the game, just like we saw in the short game. He's very good at this. He's very, very good at this. Just a calm rook g3, there's no defense. There's no defense. The queen has like two moves, and it's just not fast enough. And if you play something like bishop c8, I go here. You have bigger problems than my rook on d7. Okay, so if you can't take the knight on e6, you might as well attack my queen and kick it out. Fair enough. Very fair point. And here, the best move, apparently, according to the engine, is to add another attacker to this knight, and then the game would kind of rage on, maybe Bishop h5 or something, and complete pandemonium. But we have rook to e8, rook to e8, trying to get the rook out of the danger of the queen. Yeah, now we have rook d6, knight d5. Both queens are hanging, except one of them is not really hanging, and the other one is immortal. The hell are you talking about, Gotham? Speak in normal terms. H? F what? So, knight hangs, rook hangs, queen hangs, queen hangs. Takes my queen. This guy had. This guy doesn't even want this queen. He doesn't even want this queen. What? At this point, Kramnik is up 10 points of material, but the four sequence of moves. Rook to h7. Pawn takes. King takes rook. Queen is what Kasparov calculated resulting in an equal endgame. However, after this, there is the nice killing move in between check and check and check. And now and only now do I take the knight and I'm up a pawn. And the worst part is I'm up a pawn in the worst possible way because, well, I think in the game, uh, Kramnik played here and blundered a queen. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's actually how the game ends. But this is over. It, 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 there's still some way that black can defend this a little bit, but it's over because the weakness of your king and the, the, the pawns, the imbalance of the pawns is, is just game over. Now I'll walk my king to e3 and I'll win the pawns. Kasparov literally played knight to e6, and knowing anything about Kasparov, he saw the whole damn thing. He saw knight e6, rook g6, queen f4, rook e8, rook d6, and this whole thing. He saw the whole damn thing because he's Gary Kimovich Kasparov. Let's move on to the fourth game. Kasparov Anand was a very, very fun rivalry because they had very similar playing styles. These guys loved to fight, but it was clear that Kasparov had a bit of an upper hand uh, on Anand. I believe he won their decisive matchup 16 to four, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe Anand actually admitted it himself that, yeah, I mean, he, he had some difficulties with, with the playing style of Kasparov. Kasparov was relentless. And it, it was a bit of a shame that Anand played all his games against Kasparov when Kasparov was just the monster that he was. And yet, Vichy is playing to this day. He's in the top 10 to this day, relentless energy, and their careers obviously have gone slightly different directions, uh, but still unbelievably successful chess players and ambassadors of the game. Now, Nidorf. We've seen Kasparov play Taimanov. We got to see him play in Nidorf as well. Uh, threatening a repetition of moves, though. Uh, early here in uh, Geneva, in Credit Suisse Rapid. Uh, th there's some players who have drawn games like this before. This is actually a repetition of moves. Um, but the alternative is this, and you get your bishop chased around. This is actually kind of normal. It seems like a bit silly for black to overextend, but it's a rapid game, and I'm sure Kasparov would prefer something a bit more solid uh, in classical, but it's rapid. And uh, h5. So he just, he's like, go ahead, you want my knight? Go take it, take the damn knight, because I'm going to play h4, right? So... Takes, takes, f3, bishop's gotta go, um, and bishop comes back to f2. Black has the bishop pair, but black also doesn't have much center control. Mildly overextended pawns over here. So naturally, you would think that white might be considering a long side castle, or 
just short side castle. He's like, doesn't really believe in this attack. So, knight c6 develops the knight. Queen d2 develops the queen, a little bit. Pressure on the center, but now knight e5. Yeah, this could be a bit of a problem. And if you play b3, this really softens up this diagonal for the bishop. Right, so castles, knight g6. So we do see b3 being played. This is a bit softened up now. And Kasparov here is like, well, I'm not going to be able to castle queenside. I just can't do it. I don't have the time. d6 is too weak. Uh, I probably shouldn't castle kingside either. So let's just belligerently attack my opponent on the g-file. Keep in mind it is a rapid game. Computer here gives knight c e2 and just says, haha, you have no attack. But f4, also a good move. h4 and h3. I mean, Kasparov's like, go ahead. What are you going to do with my g and h pawns? Okay, well, Anand plays g3, doesn't want to open up his king. Great. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could put my queen in here? Yeah, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Uh, but you do have some light squared weaknesses that you have to deal with. And now Kasparov plays rook c8. The center gets completely locked here, which actually enables Kasparov to play this move, which is probably the last thing that Anand was expecting because, you know, this pawn is so weak. But because this rook ties the queen down to the defense of the knight, the queen can't go here. No one can ever go and attack the g4 pawn at all. You can play rook e1, knight d1, knight e3. By that point, black will consolidate everything and you're not going to lose the pawn at all. So, castles, queen d3, and now Gary plays f5. Very difficult decision. If you play en passant, right, then after rook f6, this side of the board comes alive and these pawns really do a, a serious damage to white's position. They take away squares from all your pieces. So, knight e2. Rook f7, bishop f8, knight e7. Look at these last three moves. Rook f7, bishop f8, knight e7. Do you understand what black is doing? Black is rerouting. Black is saying, this is done. If I get my pieces over here and I win the battle for that side and maybe over that way, I'm going to win this game. Rook d1, knight c6, c4. Big decision by Anand. We're fine. The forces are clashing. We're all rerouting to the queen side. Here come the clash of the forces. Dc4. Rook c4. Queen. Instant replay. Queen e8. You know what the idea of queen e8 is, folks? It's the fact that I just get off the center line and I'm going to try to win the battle for the light squares. Queen comes back to d2. b5 kicks out the rook. Knight b4. Remember? This diagonal. Who's going to end up on that square? Who's going to end up on that square? Hello. How does Kasparov do this? How does he do this? How is, like, how does he do it? By the way, look at all his pawns are on light squares. Fascinating. Complete color complex shift here. Bishop e3, and for the remainder of the game, Vichy has to defend the light squared weaknesses, and Kasparov has to attack them. Knight d3. You can't take it. Rook comes up a square, b4, the pawn comes where the knight was, he's got backup, right? Knight a2, now the knight drops back to c5. We're just dancing on the light squares here. Knight to e4 at any moment, right? B takes a3 for good measure, b4, bishop. The whole game is getting decided on the light squares. The entire game. b c5, all right, I take, you come back. And now bishop takes c5. Rook c5 would have been mildly more gangster. Like, and we end the game with the joint effort of the laser beam attack. I just named it that. But uh, yeah, Gary, I mean, finds a way to just like look at, I mean, just somehow all his pieces play together. It's just completely fascinating. And um, he wins this game by, obviously, in the sexy fashion, with check, 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 takes the rook. Meanwhile, this is all the king needs. The king needs to hug the rook like, yo, guard me. Because when the, when, when the checks come, when the checks come, don't do this. Don't blunder a draw. You use the, the rook as a shield. You just run away. You run away. So the game ends with king f1 and the queen comes back. Understanding that when you have an a3 and an h3 pawn in an endgame, you're probably just winning. So yeah, we have rook h7. And uh, in this position... Anand resigned because after this, this, king h8, there's no more checks, and I'm about to have a second queen. And I think Gary's going to win if he has an extra queen in an endgame. So let's move on to the final game of the video. You have ever seen Gary Kasparov's Immortal or Gary Kasparov's best game ever? This game is going to be familiar, but it's going... It's just fun to revisit. 
It's the, probably the greatest combination like ever played. Maybe, I mean, it's like top five for sure. Uh, we're in the Netherlands in 1999. Gary's opponent, Veselin Topalov, extremely strong player uh, and future world champion, as is kind of the story of this video, who plays a Peart's defense. And we don't really need to dig into too deeply into the subtlety of the opening. Uh, Gary preparing a long castle initiative and probably some sort of pawn storm with F3, G4, and etc. We have a pretty complex fight early on, like F3, B5, and Gary tries to trade bishops immediately, which is one of the ways to play this position to make sure that black doesn't castle. Queen G7 is not really a concern because you just get kicked out and you got to come back. It's mildly embarrassing. Um, bishop B7, A3. A3 prevents any sort of expansion with the move B4, but wastes a little bit of time. And so Topalov uses this waste of time to play the move E5 and attack in the center of the board. Okay, makes sense. Long castles as planned. King b1, knight c1. So every move kind of makes sense. Long castle, slide the king, slide the knight, maybe route it to a5 to try to get the bishop. I don't know. But because you can't castle, it's really making it difficult for black to, uh, to do much. So he goes the other way. Hmm. Knight b3, part of the plan. E takes d4 and trying to do something in the center. Rook d4, c5. Very common in these positions to remove white's pawn from the middle, so you can open up your own, and now the rook comes back to d1. Now, the fireworks have yet to begin, as Gary plays first the move g3, which, uh, which kind of just opens up the diagonal for the bishop, since the bishop likely has no business going over there. He fakes, potentially, that he will go to this side of the board. Um, I can't really say that there's much beyond that with the move g3, but he plays it. And now king to b8, sort of sidestepping any of that stuff, and now the knight comes to a5 uh, as planned. G3 was mildly, uh, mildly s slow from the perspective of like black could have played knight d7 maybe and, um, and tried to go for e5 and tried to go for c4 and brought his own knights to the party. But we have king b8 and this, he slides out. And now we really see the entire point of black's position. Black has three pieces staring at a certain square, right? If you would argue four once the pawn moves, so it does. I mean, Topalov follows the age-old uh, philosophy of if you have four pieces staring at a square, you should probably play on that square. It means you're pretty strong on that square as long as you're not weakening anything else. So, queen f4 check, king slides over to a7, and right now is the most tense moment of the game as the center is about to open up. As we saw in the last game, when, when Anand played c4, the position opened up. What's about to happen? Topalov shuts it all down, but Gary hops over the barrier like a kangaroo. I don't know why I'm comparing him to, to a kangaroo, but okay, he's a kangaroo. So knight d5. Now, whatever you take with, my whole center opens, right? So this opens. You lose a little bit of, of defense with the rook. I always have b4 and c3 to undermine your pawns. If my pawn gets here, I have knight c6. My rook is open. My queen is pressuring. It's a completely insane position. So obviously, after it takes, takes queen d6, this is a very human reaction. You just block everything, and you want to trade queens with Garry Kasparov. But Gary Kasparov doesn't want to trade queens with you, so he plays rook takes d4. What? I don't understand. It's just a free rook. Queen d4. Uh, sorry, rook e7. Rook e7? What? I mean, he's just sacking two rooks now. He's giving me two rooks. If you take it, queen d4 and it's mate. You simply get mated. The, the queen comes here and knight c6. Game over. It's mate. Okay. So, not a problem. King b6. Okay, queen d4, all planned, king a5, all planned. Gary Kasparov down six points of material, not as big as this advantage of this video, but the king is on a5. Now b4 is forced, king a4. Okay, we've hunted the king to a4, but how the hell are we going to get these three pieces back? No one can attack the king. Well, we're going to play queen c3, of course. We're going to threaten queen b3 mate. That's not, that's not complicated. The only move that black has is this. If black plays bishop, takes d5, then the absolutely savage king b2. The move of all time, potentially, and queen b3 sacking the queen for a smothered mate with a pawn. That's just nasty. This is just nastiness. Pure, pure nastiness from Gary Kasparov. So queen d5. The difference is that if you play king b2, thinking you're a genius, your queen gets traded, you're not a genius, you sack, you never make it into my YouTube video. Uh, but Gary Kasparov plays rook a7. So now he's threatening a mate from the other side. Bishop b7, we sack. Because the queen can't take because of this mate. So we go rook, queen c4 looking for a queen trade. We take on f6. 
And here, Tapalov tries to take the pawn and run. Take it and run away. And he gets hit with queen takes a6, king takes b4, pawn to c3. And anywhere he moves, he is going to lose. He takes like this. Now there is check all the way at the bottom of the board. And then there is check here. And at this point, the move heard around the world. Bishop back to f1. Kasparov knew the game was over, so he decided to set the pieces up to the starting position. If you take it, of course, there is, there is mate, queen c2, rook e7. So, rook d2. And now just... The most, I mean, bishop f1, rook d7 is just absolutely beautiful. You can't take my queen because you're pinned. And if you take like this, which is what happened in the game, then after it takes, takes, you lose a rook. And white still needs to be a little bit more precise. But he was because he's Gary Kasparov. And here, Topalov resigned. I mean, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And it's fitting we end on that one. Uh, there's many videos of this game, but it's like watching a movie for like the fourth time because you love it so much. Actually, I hate watching movies more than once, but um, hopefully you enjoyed it. Folks, Gary Kasparov was no joke. I mean, if that's the only thing I can say after about 40 minutes of this video, then I hope you enjoyed. Um, and uh, if you want any sort of content in the future that I haven't made, I always try to end my videos like this. Do let me know in the comments. But until next time, peace out. Get out of here.